All right, thanks so much. Um, the, yeah, I'm gonna, um, I've made way too many slides, um, but you know, we'll go as long uh, as we want. And um, yeah, I wanna tell you about the very first things in the universe and sort of all the things that we need to sort of think about of um, how they come about. And uh, <clears throat> initially, you know, when I started working on this in the mid nineties, I was sort of bummed out that I didn't think of the question because it's a nice, it's a beautiful question. You know, if the universe has a finite age and we're here now with all the stuff that we see here, you know, it was a very natural question to ask, what is actually the very first thing in the universe? Um, and so <clears throat> we've heard a lot of the things of hypothetical scalar fields and potential black holes and all these things. But here I'm trying to really sort of work out completely down to earth, you know, given what we know about the universe, what is the very first thing that might form uh, in the universe? And <clears throat> good thing is we all learn a bunch of cosmology already, but not, let's see. Okay, now I think it was too excited. Yeah, so let's talk about the, the first objects in the universe. And you know, first stars is kind of an answer already. Because when I started on this, going back to the late sixties, people started contemplating, there was this problem that globular clusters seem to be older than the universe. And there was a very strange concept that you had something in the universe that was supposed to be older than the universe. So Peoples and Dickey wrote a beautiful paper that I highly recommend, 1968. It's the famous Peoples and the famous Dickey, uh, you know, wrote this paper. And <clears throat> they go through this whole detail of how the first uh, st structures might form. And in their mind, it was gonna be a globular cluster. But that same story that they told kept being told many times over over the next 20 years for all sorts of things that people wanted to form. You know, they wanted to form machos, some wanted to make Jupiter mass things, others wanted to make supermassive black holes. And the fascinating thing is they all told the same story. It was all the same physics. Um, and the thing is, it's just hard to figure out which one is which. And that's what we dedicated many years of our lives to try to um, you know, bring, you know, develop the tools that allow us to address this question directly. And I recently started working on it again, um, specifically because JWST is just so exciting, right? To sort of now have images of things at Redshift 13, 15, and it's just gonna keep coming. Um, and we'll have this for 20 years, uh, just building data on a whole part of the universe we've never seen before. So that is just, um, that is going to be phenomenal. Let me see. So we've got some other Zoom things showing up again. Okay, whoever that is, like, hello. <laughs> Great. Okay, yeah, it's just, it showed up as a thing. And now, of course, my presentation doesn't want to go again. Okay, here we are. And okay, so you know all this whole story, the beautiful cosmic microwave background, baby picture of the universe. It was 400,000 years old and holy moly, it's incredible. Um, and we even have a whole paradigm, you know, expressed in this two point correlation function that tells us what are the relevant, the important scales. And there's one huge bump here. And that's the one I want to just briefly say, these baryon acoustic oscillations, um, that big bump here has a big impact on how matter forms later. Um, and darn, okay. <sighs> Let's see. Nope. Okay, how about this one? And the, the, the amazing thing is, as you know from your own tutorials and all the classes you've had already, is that we have direct evidence of dark matter from looking only at the CMB. And that I think is already crazy, right? Because, you know, you know, we've heard so much about dark matter already, but without it, we couldn't actually fit this beautiful spectrum. And that's a crucial thing that um, we have many other evidence for, you know, a lot of other evidence for it. But for this whole story for us, where we're now trying to figure out what is the first thing in the universe, we already know that there's dark matter. We know how much, the, uh, how many of the baryons are there? We know their temperature. You know, we know the photon to baryon ratio. 
we know the expansion rate of the universe, you know, we know all these crucial things and we know even the spectrum uh, of the fluctuations. I mean, how easy could it be? We know initial condition, we're all good physicists, right? So now we can just work out what comes out. I mean, it's just a simple homework problem, big deal. Um, and that's sort of how we went into this whole business of really trying to predict uh, what happens next. And just quickly, this baryon acoustic uh, scale, if you look at the matter two point correlation function and you plot it with this R squared weighting, you see what a strong peak that is at pretty much exactly 100 over H uh, megaparsec. And um, to make that peak, you know, all the velocities in the universe have to have correlations on these length scales in order to make that peak. And so that's a crucial thing always to have in mind that if you look at velocity fields in cosmology, they have this very large coherence length scale that sort of makes this structure. And I believe I can by eye, even with this projector, <laughs> pick out that scale when the radius is about 100 megaparsec. Um, but yeah, this would look better on my screen. Uh, nevertheless, um, and, you know, anyhow, um, that's just sort of, a, if you do anything in structure formation, you know, think about the, in the context you're working, you know, how does the BAO scale matter to you? Think about it because it's very often just forgotten when you sort of think about small scales, but there is huge things there. For example, if you look at a region in the universe that doesn't have much motion, versus some uh, rest frame, that's always when one large mode is going in velocity is going through zero. And so that's exactly the, the place of maximum compression. So the regions that have a small relative velocity will you know, have the highest uh, convergence of matter towards them. And that's, I don't wanna show this whole thing. It's just, this is the type of initial conditions I make um, with a code that we wrote that's called music. Uh, that's with my collaborator, Oliver Hahn, where here we make a universe that's 66 gigaparsec uh, big. And then I zoom in in the central region, sort of a quarter of this universe is this one, another quarter. So now we're four gigaparsec. And then I go do way down on this scale. That's where the objects will be that will make the very first stars. Um, the regions that contain about 10 to the eight solar masses, and there's halos there that are about 10 to the five solar masses in which the first collapse will happen. And I'll tell you more about it. But if I show the velocity, the, the uh, RMS velocity on these scales, you see from 64 megaparsec on, there is just this very large scale modes that are all dominated by the BAO. And, you know, that has, that all these things have some impact in the huge diversity of types of halos and accretion rates and um, merger histories that you will have for these halos. And, you know, it's sort of my dream to now study this universe that's essentially 100 uh, pro, uh, gigaparsec without the age big, and then figure out all the different environments where they make the first stars and what kind of galaxies they make do that in a, in a virtual universe, all from 100 gigaparsec down to essentially the scale of a single star is what's actually possible, which is also crazy. Ah, okay, I'll show you that one later. Um, okay, so uh, like I said, super easy, initial conditions, you know, and then you're just curious what happens next um, is, the, is the approach. You know this whole story of the history of the universe. Um, we, and so we know what to put in, in the initial conditions. We can do the whole statistics of this. So now we just need to talk a little bit about the physics. Okay, we already established that dark matter, we have direct evidence in the CMB. Don't need to talk about it more. All I'm gonna say is everything we're gonna do is using the simplest assumption that it is some small scale particle, it's collisionless. Uh, we have no other interactions from it. That's, that's the most conservative assumption we can make. And then for everything I show, whether it's a 0.1 solar mass macho, or uh, it goes down to about 40 keV particle, if I'm just looking at the thermal cutoff, um, 
the outcome of the simulations would be identical. It really doesn't matter. The whole story uh, here, you'll see the dark matter makes the regions in which then gas collapses, and it's all the physics in the gas that uh, determines what actually happened. Okay, so then, good, we need gravity. Um, Fortunately, we actually, we're totally fine with Newtonian gravity and an expanding background. And so we have multiple options of uh, how we can do that, but we'll, so, we'll just solve the Poisson equation to give us a potential. We'll take the gradient of it from which we're gonna get the accelerations. And right, just keep in mind that the density here is always the total matter density. So that includes the baryons and the dark matter. And, um, the accelerations then at every location is the same, whether you're dark matter or a baryon. Um, and that's how we implement it. You know, there's, uh, there's a lot of fun to be had and a lot to talk about if we wanted to. Um, and just briefly, in whatever dark matter we have, there is always gonna be a cutoff scale at which we have the, uh, any appreciable fluctuations. Right? There's always some small scale at which there are no density fluctuations. So for a WIMP of 100 GeV, that's about an Earth mass where that cutoff scale is. And so this, this movie is the same in any of those scenarios, whether it's warm dark matter and it's like a 10 to the 9 solar mass halo that's forming, or it's this cold WIMP dark matter and it's an Earth mass halo. The movie will look very similar for all these very first dark matter halos that form. Um, <clears throat> and you just see the classic thing, you have these very sharp caustics, filamentary objects that feed into a thing that eventually virializes and you see all these streams um, and continuous mixing of these streams of dark matter that are falling in, right? So here it's dark matter, as it falls in, it just doesn't feel anything. It just falls through and then turns around and splashes back uh, this way. Now, if it were gas, it would be totally different. The gas would, um, if gas falls in, it would completely hit it, it like a wall, right? It, that's collision no. Like the gas will not go through. So gas and dark matter in that sense behave very differently. Um, the orbits and trajectories, you have to think about in a completely different way. And <clears throat> yeah, so I like this one from the slow-mo, but uh, essentially to model systems like this, you know, we, we have to have gravity, we have to have hydrodynamics, we have to sort of get the advection of colors uh, correctly, and we have to capture eventually a huge range of length uh, and time scales. And the way we do that is uh, what's called cosmolo cosmological adaptive mesh refinement. The idea you can sort of see in this image is that we take on the large scale of the universe, we assume to be periodic, but wherever anything interesting happens, we put new grid patches and each of these boxes here themselves might have 64 by 92 by 128 zones. In each of those zones, we have all the values of the velocity, the density, the, the chemical composition, the temperature, um, you know, all the key quantities we need to, to evolve all that. And so, you know, this was a, you know, multi-year effort to include all these physics. And if you go to enzo-project.org, everything's open, the whole development is open. You can download this code and play with it. Um, and it can be used for many, many different things and not just cosmology. Okay, <clears throat> let's see, does this, yep. Okay, so hydrodynamics, um, what do we do? Um, we're on a, we're on a grid, right? So we, we took the whole universe and we sort of split it all up in, in small grid cubes. And now my fundamental unit is just one little grid cell. And in that cell, I then have faces. So I have my six faces of it. And so to solve uh, the continuity equation, what I need to think about is if I have a flux going out of the cell, I'm gonna lose some mass, right? So, and so what we're uh, calculating is the mass flux on each face. And then we add up all the mass fluxes. And then that's gonna tell us whether mass is coming in or mass is going out. And because we do it on faces and the neighboring cell will have the same flux, you know, the one 
flux I'm removing from one cell, I'm automatically putting in the other. So it's a, it's a conservative scheme in the sense we're never going to lose any mass because you know, it's always exactly mirrored. What comes out from this one goes into the next one. Okay, that's a conservative scheme. Um, sounds fantastic. I mean, it's what everybody does, but it's not necessarily always the best idea to use a conservative scheme. You should actually, the, the scheme you want is the most accurate one. The most conservative, well, whatever. You might be making huge errors, but they're symmetric, and you might be very happy about being conservative, but it might be very inaccurate. So that's not necessarily, anyhow, it just says something, it doesn't say something about the quality of it. Um, nevertheless, these are all conservative schemes we'll be using. That same idea essentially will carry through all the other equations we're using. Um, we formulate them in this way that anything uh, that needs to be conserved as it flows out from one cell, it, you make sure it arrives in the other. And so that's the same for the momentum equation where it's now the accelerations and you have uh, now a flux of momentum. And I wrote down a lot of things here. Um, we don't use hardly any of this. Essentially, the, <clears throat> what we have is a pressure. So we, you, know, you get the pressure force. Um, you get the kinetic, just the momentum um, of the fluid, which is a fancy way to call it mechanical stresses. Um, but in reality, you would have to also worry about viscosity terms. Um, but here we just assume that the mean free path for collisions is so tiny compared to the scales we saw that we can neglect, uh, neglect the viscosities directly. Um, and that's what we call the Euler equations rather than the Navier-Stokes equation. Um, it's not really a great idea. And you know, it'll, it'll show you a few examples of what, what happens because of that. Um, but OK, so that's the other. So now we have mass conservation already, momentum conservations. And now we're going to do uh, energy conservation. Very similar. <laughs> Ideally, you would do something the kinetic energies of 1 half v squared. So this is all specific, so per mass element. And then you have an internal energy, right? That's really just the uh, motions of your atoms and molecules. And then in principle, you have the potential energy. Um, that's actually usually not done this way. There's a few things, uh, Falker Springer tried it in the repo, but it is actually usually never on. There's a paper by Jung and Goodman and Stone uh, where they do it in Athena. Again, it's hardly ever used in this formulation. But if you're into numerics, I can highly recommend the papers. It's a fun thing to contemplate why that's difficult. Um, okay, so now we're conserving mass, momentum, and energy. So that's great. So we can move stuff around. The dark matter, we discretized as particles. So like everything you've heard you know, in the previous lectures, you're just sort of Monte Carloing it. And the, now the dark matter particles evolve under the same accelerations that the gas also gets. Um, on this hierarchy of grid patches that now really describe and put the resolution there where interesting things happen. <clears throat> okay, so now one key thing is if you sort of look as a function of redshift, the temperature of the gas, if you just look at the mean density of the universe, you expect to evolve like this. You know, it starts at redshift a thousand or so, you can already see. It's 2.7 Kelvin uh, times a thousand and one is, you know, that's the CMB temperature right here. But you notice initially the temperature of the gas is actually still tied to the CMB temperature. What it has to do is that the CMB photons scatter on the few electrons that are still around. There's two times 10 to the minus five in fraction electrons around. The CMB photons scatter on them. The electrons scatter on the protons. The protons do charge exchange with the neutrals. Not everybody knows that one, okay? So where you have the, a proton in a neutral hydrogen, the electron jumps over from the one proton to the other proton. That's what thermally couples now the protons with the neutrals. It's a very fast reaction. It's really important in many uh, aspects. And that's what keeps the temperature of the protons and the neutrals the same. If you look at the very back, Back here, it would start deviating, but this is at a tiny redshift. In reality, reionization already raises the temperatures here. So, <clears throat> but there is a principle. I mean, it just shows that 
uh, what those processes are. Yeah, so that was in the context now of, uh, of knowing what are our initial conditions. We had, um, we set up initial conditions close to rec uh, re recombination. Then as the universe expands, the gas cools quicker uh, than the CMB and reaches quite low temperatures. So at redshift 30 or so, you're around 10 Kelvin in the gas. Um, so that's cold. That means it doesn't have a lot of pressure. That means you can actually, you know, collect it uh, pretty easily. So this cosmological genes mass is around 10 to the four solar masses. So objects that can, can contain gas are around 10 to the four solar masses total. Of course, is always dominated by dark matter. <laughs> So, and now comes the interest. Oh, sure, please. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, this one is the CMB temperature, that one. Oh, this one, I think, um, let's see. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I just put a power law through my asymptotic thing at the end because I wanted to read off exactly what redshift I should put in if I'm gonna do an approximation of the power law here, right, that's all. Like, um, because for many of the codes, that's totally fine if you start it there and don't inclu include the constant heating. Yeah. Um, but okay, so now the fun, uh, fun part starts um, because the crucial thing that allows the first structures to form is that there is a path to make hydrogen molecules. And this path goes through electrons uh, as catalysts. You take electrons and they can photo attach um, is what this process is called because the photons coming out at the end. They can photo attach and give the negative hydrogen uh, ion. Who knows anything about the negative hydrogen ion? Ever heard of it? What is it good for? Who needs it? Anything. Cyclotrons, wow. That I have not heard. That would be cool. Yeah, yeah, is it? Yeah, yeah, no, it's not an antiproton. This is uh, H minus. It has a second electron on the hydrogen. It's a proton with two electrons. It's super crazy. It provides a huge amount of opacity in the sun. The sun would have a different color without H minus. It is, it's remarkable. It only has a single bound state. There is no transition in H minus. So there's no other state that it can transit to. It's either in this 0.75 EV, you know, it's very little energy and the electron is gone, right? It's very feeble, but it works. And it's a whole big deal in the sense of having this process and the inverse, you know, where it's the gamma hitting the H minus, splitting it off again. That's what in the sun makes the opacity is sort of the other way around. But for us, <clears throat> what's neat is we can put it on there and now because the H minus, you know, is lopsided with its two electrons, it has a dipole moment. Dipole moments are good for reactions. And in particular, what I can do with this now dipole moment, heavy, funky, lopsided ion, when it hits a neutral hydrogen atom, I can create molecular hydrogen in an excited state, which eventually will decay and also give off a photon. But you get the electron back. So I can use the electron repeatedly, right? And that's what you remember is a catalyst. Um, and so um, that's, that's a key thing. And molecular hydrogen, um, it doesn't really like to radiate, but you know, if you ask very nicely or wait long enough, it will do it. And so it has rotational and vibrational states that, and there's two interesting configurations, ortho and para, like of depending where the nuclear spins are, makes a big difference whether it's 512 or 809 Kelvin, uh, for the lowest lying rotational state um, is a big deal and there's a lot of fun, fun stuff there. But the 500 Kelvin is the crucial number. It means is if I have a gas that's not, that's about 500 Kelvin, neutral hydrogen can hit the molecules. The molecules start rotating and then quantum mechanically, they give off an infrared photon. And that photon energy now leaves the cloud, but it came from the kinetic energy of the neutral hydrogen atom that hit the molecule. There was a cooling mechanism. And so then if you make the mistake of dissipating, gravity will always win. And so that's what is crucial now to make anything interesting happen is that we have this form of cooling. You had a question? Oh, yeah. The, 
So that's a 0.75 uh, EV uh, gamma. I mean, photon, um, it's a very boring energy. It just doesn't get stuck anywhere. It just keeps going. And so there's a, there's a tiny little background uh, from that. No, I know, I know. Yeah, it's very low um, because the abundance of H minus is really low. Um, Right. Endothermic, yes. Yes, exactly. But H minus, um, well, E minus already has a low abundance to begin with. You know, we're at this two times minus minus five. Um, and then, um, you know, an argument that doesn't actually really help now is like, yeah, you definitely make a bunch of these gammas, but you know, to make an appreciable flux that competes, um, you know, way above, let's see. What's nice about it, it's, it's higher energy than the CMB at that time, so that's good. So, you know, it would be separate because the CMB is horrible with 10 to the nine photons per baryon. You know, imagine how many reactions you would have to make. Anyhow, but so it would be on the high energy tail of that, that's good. Um, but, um, and yeah, but we should do that calculation more carefully. Um, but I know I have a little intuition just from H alpha and uh, sort of other recombination lines you have from ionized gas, which is, is very common because there's all the hydrogen involved. Um, um, even, even those are very hard to find from, from high redshift. So my intuition would be it's, it's quite low, but it would still be nice to actually have a full calculation with this H minus background would look like. Um, <clears throat> good question. Yeah, so what we need is um, the thing that got Avocadro the Nobel Prize in chemistry. He said that if the temperature is a couple of times higher, the reaction is maybe two to eight times faster. It was a good time to get a Nobel Prize. You know, you didn't have to be very precise. Uh, but, the, but, you know, that's sort of the whole point is obviously you know, I mean, it's a big deal back then because you didn't have the atomic concept yet. And so now for us, it's trivial to see, okay, it's hotter, so you have higher speeds. And so the, the reactants get to, together more often. So chemistry would be more active at higher, uh, higher temperatures. And <clears throat> that's sort of the crucial thing. So now how do we raise the temperatures? It's, it's all by throwing more dark matter into larger halos. They make deeper potential wells. And now they attract more baryons. And as the baryons get compressed by the gravity of the dark matter, it heats up because work is done to, to make the, you know, to put all this gas into a smaller volume, you, you know, you're acting against the pressure. So that brings the heat up and you heat to roughly the virial temperature of the halo, right? And so now at some point, this reaction is gonna be fast enough um, to make appreciable H2. Um, but even if we made a bunch of H2, if we don't have high enough temperature to excite the hydrogen molecule, still nothing would happen, right? It still would just make chemistry. We wouldn't change the thermodynamic state yet. <clears throat> and so I spent all my master thesis on going through hundreds of reactions to come up with this final minimal model uh, that we did at the end. And then we wrote a very fast solver to solve this chemical network in equilibrium uh, because we have to do this on hundreds of millions and actually billions of zones now. Um, I cannot just call some package. Um, you know, it would just totally kill my performance of the code. We had to really write our own ODE solver that is fast, um, accurate, and stable. Um, so <clears throat> that's what we did in a series of papers. That, around that time. And so the, the first few is just a six species model where you, know, you do just hydrogen and helium, everything to do with hydrogen, uh, ionized hydrogen, helium, ionized helium, doubly ionized helium. And that's really just collusional ionization and radiative recombinations uh, are the crucial processes. This channel we already talked about, how to make molecular hydrogen. There's another one that is somewhat subdominant but I'll, I'll still mention it briefly, where you can take a proton and make the simplest of all molecules, the uh, H2 plus. 
So now it's two protons and one electron. Um, and, and then the H2 plus, again, because it's lopsided, it has some better chance of making H2 and giving back the H plus. So here is the proton that acts as a catalyst. Um, and it's just the way the reaction coefficients work out. And part of it is just the speed electrons, you know, it's just the racers, right? They have the 2000 times lower mass, so they go much faster. So they really go from proton to proton much quicker. That's why these, this Jaden wins. And then there's a whole bunch that you need to keep in mind, things like H minus hitting a proton and then giving its second electron to that other proton and you come out with two neutral hydrogen uh, atoms is one. There's others um, where you have just uh, actual collisions where E minus hits the H2 molecule so hard that it just breaks up into two hydrogen atoms uh, giving the electron back. And then this guy, I should have really made big. So that's a, um, oh, sorry, actually, I didn't write that down. Sorry, one second. No, okay, so that's a very common one to destroy something. And, oh, nope. Oh my God, let me see. Aha. Oh yeah, yeah, I have a typo here, that's fine. No, 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 it's fine. Let me see. Oh yeah, I'm missing one actually. There's a, there's a really crucial one that comes in here um, that is three hydrogen atoms hitting each other simultaneously making one uh, hydrogen molecule and one hydrogen atom comes out. And this three body process, you know, is of course uh, at low density never happens compared to the two body. But at high density, the three body becomes the dominant one. And once that rate crosses, it's always much faster, right? Like once uh, it's as fast as the two body, if you then increase the density another factor of 10, the rate goes up a factor of a thousand, right? Because it's three bodies coming in. So the, um, and, and we'll see that has a big impact actually what happens later. All right, so we have, yeah, please. Exactly. So this is primordial gas. So um, this is really the minimum network that you need if you don't have carbon, oxygen, you know, if you're only talking about stuff made in the Big Bang, that's what you need to capture the thermal history. There's other really fun stuff happening with lithium hydride and there's also de deuteron, I mean, uh, uh, HD and like there's really beautiful chemistry and there's H3 plus and there's fun stuff to think about, but it has no impact on the thermal evolution of the material. So this is hundreds of Kelvin where this becomes important. And, um, but the network is designed, it's actually good to go to 10 to the eight Kelvin. I mean, but you know, all the molecular hydrogen, all that will be destroyed and you just have a plasma. Yes. What time scale do the halo start forming? Okay, so the, um, I'll show you a bunch of examples. Uh, it's really a statistical thing. So if you think about the entire observable universe, you know, there is a patch where a star will have formed at redshift 70 or 80. You know, so somewhere at redshift 80, you could find a single star. But if you go to redshift 50, you know, there's billions already. Um, don't quote me exactly on that one, but you know, I'm just, you know what I mean? It's really a statistical thing. The region that later becomes our Milky Way will have had at least 10 to the five, 10 to the six of those regions that will, made a, will may have, will have made population three stars. And so um, it's now those regions that are in clusters today, for those regions, everything started earlier, right? So they will have had, you know, things at redshift 30 and 40, whereas something like just the Milky Way um, is quite a bit later, right? So it's really those statistics of the, uh, the halos and the, yeah, it gives you the whole range. But so, yeah, for one lucky object, you know, a dredge of 80 would, would already be a fun thing to think about. And <clears throat> so it makes sort of this crazy mess. I'll show many examples of this, but it, uh, 10 to the five solar mass halos. And what we show is here, isocontours of the density. 
And the question is just of what, what happens now. So essentially um, that story was sort of the same that everybody was telling. We make this object, there's all this interesting gas dynamics, then something, the hydrogen molecules will form, they will start cooling, and then it makes a central object that's coolish. And the question then is what actually happens next? Do you make a cluster of stars? Do you make black holes? Do you, uh, so that's what we sort of do in here. I'll just show you that movie that we did for Discovery Channel. So sort of same idea, uh, it's isodensity contours that are transparent. So the lighter the color, the higher the density. What's visualized is only the gas. We don't show the dark matter uh, in this movie. These objects are around 10 to the four, few times 10 to the four solar masses. And you see they look little blobs. They're all just falling together. It's along a filamentary directions as always. So there's another blob coming in from there. You drive turbulence, of course, you know, as the whole thing is sort of wobbling, you get all your, now we started zooming in, that's why it's getting big. We're sort of headed towards this region that already managed to cool from the molecular hydrogen. And now we couldn't keep the time evolution because it's just so much data. So we, we just held time fixed and started zooming in. And you saw here we get more of these sort of roundish isodensity contours that has to do with the property of molecular hydrogen that once it's above 10 to the four particles per cubic centimeter, it doesn't like to cool anymore. Down here, we are actually at the size of the solar system. Um, and you sort of see a disc-like uh, object uh, around a protostar that's forming and that's accreting at a very high rate. Um, so at this point, I had not developed the techniques to do radiation transport so to, to see what happens with the radiation from the first stars. So we just skipped the 3 million years and made it explode. <laughs> you know, Discovery Channel, we're like, okay, on the sly. Um, you know, but here all the ejecta are now being thrown out and that includes parts of your body, right? Like uh, roughly about a pinky worth of your body was part of doing this. Um, and so some of these uh, heavy elements made in these stars, you know, the carbon, oxygen, this one wouldn't have gone to iron, uh, actually. And we'll come out. Okay, so <clears throat> the, the, the paper that was sort of, it's my most famous paper, I guess, is, it was in science in 2002. That will show you sort of here, what we just saw in the movie, you know, at redshift 100 in the gas, there's nothing because you had silk damping and the pressure is still high in the gas, the redshift 100. So even if the dark matter already is clumping, the gas is not feeling it yet. Its own pressure is too, too high. Um, but here, this particular case, it was at redshift 24. You can see now all these things, they, they look perfectly round. And it sort of looks weird as if we we're like screwed up the calculation. But it turns out that's exactly the physics, it's gene smoothing, right? It's exactly why the earth is round is because pressure is perfectly balanced in gravity. And that's what happens here. There's no cooling, nothing. And so the, you know, the gas has time to equilibrate. It feels its potential well, and it just finds a round surface to go with it. But once we go above that scale where the pressure waves are just as fast as the dynamical times, then we get more complicated structures that are not as round uh, anymore. Um, and that's, you know, in this particular case, really then collapsed at redshift 18. Um, and here are slices then through the gas density at a six kiloparsec scale down to 6% um, of a parsec. And, and accordingly also the temperature. And so what you see is, this is the accretion shock in the gas so as materials falls in, it hits the shock and stops, right? All the velocity goes into compression and it gets hot. So totally the opposite of what dark matter did. Dark matter just fell through and it didn't know anything about this. And then it just, you know, turned around way on the other side. Here, uh, it's very brutal, it just hits it. Along the filament, same thing happens, gas comes in, but it now carries a lot of momentum. So it shocks later, it shocks deeper in the, in the halo, but it drives all that turbulence in here. And then <laughs> assume then it's sort of the central pixels here. We have a cold region that's like a, an analog to a molecular cloud, about six parsec in a size, about 200 Kelvin. 
whereas the outside here is about a thousand Kelvin. So it's only a factor of five or so cooler. Um, and then we go in another factor of a hundred. So that was the crazy thing at the time. Nobody's seen anything like this to do adaptive mesh refinement to capture so many scales, all self consistently. And mind you, we started with cosmological and initial conditions. And we're talking about tiny scales. This is thousands of AU. Yeah, yeah. So this is now all the, the timing, though, you know, it's all crazy. Like out here, it's a hundred million year time scale, 50 million year time. Here, it's sort of a million year times, well, maybe, you know, five million year, 10 million year time scale. Here, it's sort of a few hundred thousand year time scale. Here, we're sort of at thousands of year time scales. And so, depending exactly where we pin it, like the protostar hasn't formed at all yet, or it, uh, you know, it just uh, 2,000 years later, it's, it's already there and starts accreting. So, all these time scales, I'll show you. Oh, exactly on this slide. <laughs> so how like the density profile, for example, sort of evolves and you see the number is always 200 years. This profile is 200 years later than that last profile. And this profile is 1,500 years after this last profile. In this one, you know, 3,000 years, 30,000, 0.3 mega years. I, I, I still remember all of this. This is great. Uh, this, as I pretty much told you exactly the right numbers. Um, um, and, but so you see how this collapse then pro progresses and this will keep going. And I'll show you a simulation in a moment where it goes all the way. Um, and, uh, um, but you see there's everywhere, there's always some little kinks and like, you know, all these little kinks all have to do with molecular hydrogen. It's all the physics of the little hydrogen molecule that picks out all these different scales in the collapse. And the whole nature, even of the nature of the turbulence uh, is picked out that way. One really nice place to see that is this curve here, which is the radial velocity. So I go to the central point and then just ask spherical averages, what's the infall velocity of the material around me? And you see it has these various dips and these dips is mass scales. They were picked out by the physics of molecular hydrogen. The one was where it can cool at all. The other one was where actually it didn't cool particularly well anymore. So at 10 to the four particles per cubic centimeter, it's um, whether you collide with it or not, it's already excited. You just have to wait now for the spontaneous decay of this excited level to get the photon that will cool the cloud. So, you know, even if you increase the density, you're not enhancing the cooling rate because you're already saturated. But now you just get a constant thing per molecule. You always get the same photon output. So now the cooling time becomes independent of density. And that's why in the central region, that temperature goes up a little bit, um, which is exactly this temperature rise here. It has to do with the molecule slowing down and its ability to cool. But then there's this new dip. And where the heck is this new dip coming from? Well, what's happening is that you start making molecular hydrogen with this three body reaction. You got to high enough densities that all of a sudden you went from 10 to the minus three hydrogen fraction to almost fully molecular. So now you can cool a thousand times faster than you did when you only had 10 to the minus three in the molecular hydrogen fraction. So now uh, that picks out a new scale. And that in this case was one solar mass. This process continues uh, another time as we get to higher densities, there's a process called collisional induced emission. That's what, when you have two hydrogen molecules, they, they run into each other, create a temporary dipole moment. And through that can generate infrared photons in the continuum. That's collisional induced emission. That's a new path to cool when you have a lot of molecules at high density. And that kicks in at around 10 to the 14, 10 to the 15, which I don't show here, but that picks out a new mass scale. And that one is 10 Jupiter masses. And that is sort of a fact uh, of what all these calculations seem to imply, both for primordial stars and stars in our galaxy, protostars are born at 10 Jupiter masses. Doesn't matter how heavy the star is ever gonna be, they, they start all at 10 Jupiter masses. And the rest is all about how much will they accrete. 
uh, uh, one Jupiter mass is 10 to the minus three solar masses. So it's, it's 1% of the solar mass. And <laughs> Earth mass is 10 to the minus six um, solar masses. Yep. Right. Okay. Now, <clears throat> there's a whole thing, you know, we just only looked at one. When we do a lot of realization, once in a while, the way the halos come together, you also have enough angular momentum that you might make multiple uh, objects. And so <clears throat> we had a, um, a cover actually of science also for this one um, in a simulation uh, done by Matt Turk, uh, who's a student with me at Stanford. And while I have it up, I wrote a Physics Today article in 2011. So if you want a gentle introduction to this whole thing to look up, just look that up, 2011, it's, it's just me, the first stars. And, uh, but what's interesting is you then can form binary or multiple systems. And that's particularly interesting in the context of what we heard earlier about, you know, LIGO's 230 solar mass black hole um, for us was like, oh yeah, that's perfect. You know, it's exactly the type of thing where it was like, yeah, that's the type of mass as I would have expected. I'll show that in a second. Actually, I'll skip that for now. Um, oh. Okay, let's see. So I didn't talk about magnetic field. I mean, I'm obviously, you know, just waiting for the questions. How about magnetic fields? Um, and the thing is, you know, it, we expect uh, large magnetic fields uh, early on. Like the ones that are naturally made during recombinations are really tiny. I mean, it's like 10 to the minus 22 Gauss. I mean, it's, None of it makes any real sense anymore. Like LAMA radii are, are macro, crazy macroscopic. Um, nevertheless, <clears throat> the, if you, you know, any putative tiny field that you have through all this turbulent motions that we just witnessed and watched will in fact amplify magnetic fields. So if you just have a tiny amount, you can exponentially grow magnetic fields by winding it up. And, you know, there's, there's a, a key simple equation we can use is an approach to what's called ideal magnetohydrodynamics, which then makes it look like a regular conservation equation, very similar to the ones we've just been solving already, uh, which looks like this. And we can use the same numerical techniques that we developed for the momentum and then the energy conservation equation to also do ideal MHD. And we've been doing that. Um, like keep in mind, it's really an approximation. I mean, this is not a this is not really exactly how everything works. It's just a very convenient numerical model, just like the Navier-Stokes equations is some approximation to this huge embody problem that we are we've been doing it so long we're very comfortable with it. Right? That doesn't mean it's it's always going to give us the right answer. Anyhow, but the cool thing is if you had a magnetic field and you just compressed it there is sort of just through flux freezing, which happens in MHD, you would expect to get a, a, the magnetic field to increase with the density to the two thirds power, which is sort of this line here. And um, what happens though, is that in the calculations, it's a little bit steeper, okay? However, the, it really depends on what resolution we use of how steep that is. And you see that was our highest resolution. It would be steeper than this one. And the J here stands for Jean's length. So right, that's the length scale where the gravitational sort of dynamic time is shorter than the sound crossing time. So if I have 128 zones per Jean's length, then in a region that is thinking about collapsing gravitationally, so overcoming its pressure, I already have 100 zones in it. And 100 zones is nice. I mean, you know, like, if you take a picture with 100 pixels on a side, and that's pretty decent, uh, or at least you can recognize something. Um, but you know, if I only have, um, so the fewer I have, the less of the motions I'll be able to represent. And the, you know, the fewer of the motions I have, the less I will turbulently amplify the magnetic field. So that's <laughs> um, one key thing. And that's what I'm excited about now. I mean, or Actually, let me just say this, um, how much resolution you have, it really determines, you know, where your velocity power spectrum cuts off. 
And so you can see this just visually. Here, genes parameter 16, 32, 64 for three different length scales. And if we just focus on the lower panel here at 1,000 AU scale, the world looks so simple, the uh, less resolution you have. You know, you're like, oh, okay, yeah, I got a dense thing, and then I got some couple of arms, and they shed some angular momentum, and you know, now I'm now I'm sort of funding more material towards the center, and right. Well, but as soon as you start coming above some critical Reynolds number, things get a lot more interesting. Um, so for the magnetic field, that's a big deal, but I think it has a lot of implications for the rest. It's just the universe does not look like this, right? It's like it also doesn't look like this. It's even more crazy than this, right? You go to the beach and you just watch a wave and you're like, oh my God, yeah, that looks totally different. Nothing looks as, you know, this is all numerical, just not having enough information. You know, you just didn't put enough points there to be able to capture all the interesting nonlinearities that would happen. And so by just pretending you only have a few zones or you're averaging over so many things and averaging destroys information. And so you can understand that there is a numerical viscosity that comes from this artificial averaging or having too poor resolution. And that's where I got so excited now that I can do 512 cells per gene length now. So this is the calculation that finished a couple of weeks ago. And um, so this is four times larger than the one I showed you. Um, with 128 cells, but you have to think about that, um, that this is 64 times larger because it's in 3D. And in fact, this one, I evolved much longer than the other one. But in fact, it's actually a few hundred times higher in resolution. And unfortunately that uh, projector doesn't, doesn't fully do it justice, but still same story. You have filaments coming in, you're really driving turbulence. You see all this, uh, craziness here. As I zoom in on a 20 parsec scale, you just, you know, you keep picking out the densest objects uh, in this outer scale, but you see filamentary things and shocking regions on this, you know, where you have very steep uh, transitions. That's hallmark signs of supersonic turbulence. But then as we zoom in on that central object, it actually looks much more smooth. And I don't know whether you can tell, but there is a few actually, well, there's a few sort of dark round uh, regions in here. And if I don't put the laser point, it might be easier to find it, but uh, these are like vortex tubes. So when, you know, when you have dolphins, you know, sort of they blow little vortex tubes sometimes for, for fishing or, you know, smokers do blow smoke rings. It's that thing that keeps that stable uh, is what you get in subsonic and trans uh, transonic turbulence. So it's not shocks in, filaments, it's more vortical motions where you have vortices being uh, transported. You see that on this scale, but then the three body molecular hydrogen kicks in. So now, you know, we're cooling again a thousand times faster, but now we get uh, supersonic turbulence again, and you see much uh, sharper edges um, in, the, in the turbulence. And then within here, now again on a thousand AU scale, just remember we just looked at a thousand AU scale on that last one. Uh, this looks very different. Um, you, you now get all these beautiful hydrodynamic instabilities that are mediated because as this strong shock happens in this supersonically turbulent region, you're actually dissociating molecular hydrogen here which then gets hot. And then you have a hot fluid pushing into, into a dense cold fluid. So it's called the richmeyer meshkov instability, which leads to all these beautiful mushroom-like uh, clouds. So I zoom in onto that thing. And to me, I mean, I, I just spent the last few months only staring at the simulation. Every day I wake up, I check, does it have a new output? And I'm really, really happy. And I'm like, oh. It's crazy how much time I've lost to this, but I just love it. I mean, the thing is, I mean, I just can't tell you, like over this 20 year period, you know, like from this stuff, people already called us crazy. We did 64 cells per gene length. Everybody's, ah, you only need four. We've proven it, you know, and then we did 64 because we wanted to be sure that we had a resolution study and we were convinced that we get the same results as we increase the resolution. And we did get the same results. Then we were still worried. And so we put in a new hydrodynamic solver 
to make sure we get the same result. Okay, we got the same results. And so then we like felt, okay, we really figured this one out. But now, you know, compared to that time though, it's like some factors of a few thousand above what the stuff I was used to, which was crazy revolutionary back then. And now I can do that. Um, anyhow, you see, I, I'm excited. Okay, uh, but you know, that's sort of the, the key feature to me is it starts looking like a real physical system, right? There are actual fluid instabilities. I can capture it on all the different scales that are relevant in the problem. And so here's the same in temperature. And I'll just zoom in again on my favorite part. So here's this hot region that is now pushing into this cold region and all these sort of mushroom clouds and plumes that you have is really the hot stuff penetrating over it. And the shear flows between the hot and the cold medium, they, they are the ones that sort of mix it in. And you get little, you get sort of little vortices in the back curling off that, you know, they try to mix the material together. Um, but <laughs> it's not all done because the whole region in here is actually collapsing further. Oh, I should just show, that's what I said in words already. This is the molecular hydrogen fraction. It goes from one, to 10 to the minus six, and you sort of see it's all fully dissociated, the molecular hydrogen. And here it's 0.76, that's the hydrogen fraction. So it means it's fully molecular where it's the saturated blue. But the other part that you notice is actually all the length scales also visually are actually much bigger in the H2. And that has to do with the chemical time scales, although fast, they're not as fast as the flow time scale. And so all the structures you see are closely correlated with their velocity of field, but they have this whole sort of lag. And that's what makes them actually look, I think, particularly pretty in the sense that, I don't know, the types of shapes are really different. And so there's a lot of work to be done and analyzing this turbulence in this. All right, <clears throat> and so here's just a zoom in movie. Uh, left is the density, right is the temperature. Um, you know, here we are at about 200 parsecs across. That's the cold, coldish molecular cloud region that we see is about 10 parsec across. You already see the dense core in the middle here. That's a bit warmer. That's where you have 10 to the four particles per cubic centimeter in the molecular hydrogen. You see the first signs of shocking, but now the three body reaction kicks in and it actually gets cooler again. So now we're collapsing uh, even further we're already at, oh, this is crazy, uh, the 15 particles per cubic centimeter. And then we see this dissociation here. So see how the, the whole density structure is now full of these holes that are all hot. And that's, you know, you have these shocks now where you have molecular hydrogen being dissociated. Uh, and so the whole nature of the turbulence changes multiple times. You know, in this last one here, it's dominated by the chemical reaction network. Uh, whereas the other ones um, was really more about how stiff the equation of state is of whether it's more transonic or supersonic. <clears throat> Anyhow, one key thing to keep in mind, if anybody tells you anything about collapse, you should always think about collapse is really complicated and it's really deep. So when somebody tells you about primordial black holes, no problem, I have it immediately. You know, most of the time you have to collapse a very, you know, long way from whatever you started out with. And a lot of things happen along this way. Um, and so if you have any sort of turbulence, one particular thing that you know, always strikes us in these calculations is that you have sort of disks and then the central part is a bar and within that bar, there's another disk and that disk might itself have another bar. And you know, that's how the collapse first happens. And then once you have an object, you know, all the accretion that comes later funnels through these things. And if you have an accretion disk, never think of it just as a thing. You know, that will keep precessing as more material falls on it, it will have a slightly different angular momentum and it will try to keep moving the whole uh, thing. And which you understand, you know, nothing's spherical. Um, and that's, I think there were two questions, yeah? That's correct, yes, shocks form and you move faster than the sound speed, yeah. Right.
Yeah, yeah, exactly. What's the reason why can we get uh, supersonic turbines? It's always when we are being able to cool efficiently. So in the supernova, you know, it might be that thing, you know, you're dissociating uh, iron. And so now that takes up a lot of uh, thing or in the parent stability supernova, you might be putting, you get so hot that all your radiation energy goes into rest mass energy of the electron and the positron. And so now you're like, the pressure is gone because you took all the energy and put it in this inert rest mass, right? And so then that makes your equation of state soft and you start collapsing. Here, uh, it's the hydrogen molecules giving off radiation so quickly that every time you compress, the temperature doesn't go up. So, you know, now you keep going and then the pressure only goes up like the density. And so anything that has an equation of state of four thirds or soft um, is gravitationally unstable. And so when the temperature doesn't go up, that's isothermal, that's a gamma of equals one compared to four thirds and compared to the five thirds you have for an ideal gas. Yeah. Sometimes in a few of the regions, yeah. Yes, exactly. And it does, um, once it gets optically thick, the radiation, even though it wants to get rid of it, the radiation is not making out. Just like in the sun where, you know, the photon that hits your eye took 100,000 years to get from the center of the sun to the surface and then two seconds to your eye. Yeah. Okay, you know, we calculate the entire collapse, the whole thing, the whole movie, it just, so that all of it has a different time scale at all the different times. So, right, it, it, it captures 25 orders of magnitude and density, the whole calculation. All right, and then I think you have, yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, every locally, I mean, super locally, sure. Like you have a temperature, like it's a fine assumption actually that it's Gaussian distribution of the molecules. You know, there's enough collisions that it is in local thermodynamic equilibrium. Um, yeah, that's for sure. So it's fine to use the hydro equations uh, there. And uh, I double checked actually all those collision rates and all the, uh, the time scales we have are all still longer than uh, the microscopic equilibration between also between neutrals and ions. Well, for the molecular hydrogen, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well, but, right, so, but for the thermodynamic equilibrium, it's really about getting the temperatures of all the different components to be uh, in equilibrium, that is given. But in terms of the thermodynamic history of each parcel is different. And depending how they flow, it takes a somewhat longer for the molecular hydrogen to form. So you can be chemically inhomogeneous, uh, but still be in uh, hydro, local hydrodynamic uh, thermodynamic uh, equilibrium. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, I mean, in, in the galaxy, it's even crazier. You know, the H two formation time scale is a giga year. It takes forever to make molecular hydrogen on dust grains, and so the all sorts of things happen to the gas. It's sort of very slowly, like there's a response by the molecular hydrogen. Yeah. Mm. All right. Let's just look at it for a minute. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, so I said all these things in words. It's, it's just fun um, that we get to this place now where we can characterize the, uh, the different transitions of the various types of turbulence in this collapse. Um, and so we know a lot about how these things form.
So then one quick thing, um, if we then go and ask, you know, as I go out from the center of this object and just look at how much mass I have in spheres around it. And then I look at how long it would take at its current radial velocity to travel the radius at its at. Or I do it more fancy with a density weighting and I get the same answer. But I can uh, tell of how long it would take to uh, take these 30 solar masses to accrete would take not less than 10,000 years. Okay. So that's a very fast time scale of all this material I can just dump on this pro uh, protostar. And it's really hard to see how we could possibly do anything against it. It's already on its way. It's so centrally concentrated. It, the gas knows, you know, it's, it's already headed that way. And it knows where it's gonna go because gravity is only gonna get stronger there. So um, I just don't know how to slow this down. Like, so I don't know how to make a low mass star because there's all this stuff that already wants to fall on top of it. But if I now compare it with what a star of this mass, how long it would take it to become a star that it settles on the main uh, zero age main sequence, that's what's called the Kelvin Helmholtz time. So, you know, the last cooling time for it to get to become a full fledged star of that mass, um, you see this time scale over here, like three times 10 to the seven, that's what Kelvin was on about. Or like what's wrong, like the sun, you know, is only, it can't possibly be older than 3 million years because, you know, they didn't know about fusion. And so then, you know, you know this one. And then there's an interesting one over here that massive stars, it just becomes flat. Everything's like just below a hundred thousand years. They just go so, so fast, um, but it just becomes a constant. But for this 30 solar mass uh, thing, just to make it a star is like, I don't know, it takes 200,000 years. And, but within, you know, 8,000 years, I'm already dumping 30 solar masses on top. So this is how I conclude that I'm not making a low mass star there. Um, you know, and we're already in this regime where we'll be optically thick. And so then, you know, I also don't know anymore how to fragment it into a whole lot of small pieces that could possibly escape. So that's how we concluded it must be a massive star. But we didn't really know. And in the sense of how much larger it could get, you know, I, I was saying like, I don't see how it could be less than 30 solar masses. But then, you know, at 300 solar masses, if we sort of look here, our accretion time becomes a million years. And that's actually getting close to the lifetime of one of these uh, stars because they only live about 2 million years. And then they would like to go supernovae or make a black hole. So I, I said, okay, like maybe I'll call it quits over here. And that's why I kept giving this as our error bar saying the first stars should be somewhere between 30 and 300 solar mass. Exactly, but this is just assuming nothing else than accretion happens. Okay, so when I make one of these stars, they're gonna, they're gonna have surface temperatures of 100,000 Kelvin. They put out UV flux at 10 to the six times the sun. Um, I mean, of the total luminosity, UV and everything's in the UV. So it, it has huge impact and all the gas that's in there is gonna heat all of that. So, so this was before I even talk about how much, you know, what radiation will do to this envelope. So I think up here, because it's so steep, it then becomes fairly easy that radiation actually stops some of the accretion. And that's why, you know, I had sort of arguments, we, you know, there was a computing group by Larson and, uh, and Broman Larson, and they kept talking about 1,000, 2,000 solar mass stars. And we were always like, no, nah, I don't think so. Um, but, you know, it's hard to do, I mean, we literally cannot do the calculation. So when my simulation, you know, I stop when it takes me 10 minutes to do a time step and I'm only mod modeling two minutes in the, in the virtual universe. So my computation becomes longer than the thing I'm modeling. Then I have to call it quits, right? Because I wanna evolve it another 100,000 years to sort of get exactly to this question of how does it settle onto the zero age main sequence but, you know, I can't, you know, it's just so many time steps. There's no way 
even if the computer would do it, I'm not sure I would believe it in the sense it's so many time steps it's taken that, you know, how do I convince myself that um, I'm still accurately solving the whole system of equations. So these things are in fact not calculable past, much past the point of what I've been showing you so far. So this is as good as it gets. And that was sort of the reason why I actually for 20 years hardly did anything in this field anymore. I knew I couldn't do much better. But now that 20 years later, it's like doing a hundred times more so and a thousand. There's a few extra things we can learn, but some of these crucial things of what is the exact mass, forget it. Like this is not calculable. Even in uh, 200 years, you will not be able to calculate that. It's not a, not a thing. Okay, let's just see this line. It tells you how long it takes this much mass to fall to the center. And this is the time scale, right? So in a thousand years, I'm gonna get four solar masses. And then in 30 solar masses, I get an 8,000 years. And the, um, but the response of a star is slow. Um, that's how long it takes a star to cool. So I don't know how to stop it. That, you know, it's already on its way. This material will fall on top of this protostar. So how am I gonna make a smaller star? You know, yeah, it's already in such a tiny region. You know, I can't like make a, a, a star cluster or like, there's just nothing left uh, for me to do. And so that's where sort of that lower limit comes from. And all of it has to do with the higher temperatures. Molecular hydrogen is just much warmer. And that's why all the speeds are fast. And that's why the accretion rates are fast. In our own galaxy, the whole thing, it's um, the temperatures are, you know, 20 times smaller. And that's what makes the accretion times lower. And that's how we can have much easier make low mass stars. Fundamentally, it goes back just to this, you know, 512 Kelvin or the para configuration of molecular hydrogen. Say again? Shocks don't stop anything. They just turn kinetic energy into internal energy. Internal energy then gets radiated and it starts falling again. So, so shocks, you know, I mean, in an explosion, well, yeah, but generally the gravitational collapse, you know, shocks are just sort of an intermediate phase. Um, all right, I said all those things in words. I'll tell you about, um, it's okay. So observational consequences, we talked briefly, you know, it would fit very well. Like what we find having multiple systems in some of the initial conditions we study and really having characteristic mass scales closer to hundred solar masses would make sort of nice ideas uh, for the possibility of where could have these merging black holes that LIGO found could have come from. The other thing you might've liked is that you formed it very early on. And so you might've had a lot of chances to tighten the binary. Um, and from that, you know, that's one. And one quick other thing is we've never found a single zero metallicity star in the Milky Way. And that's the other thing that's actually very consistent with what we find that you have, if you have very massive stars early on, they dead within 3 million years. So there's no, you know, of course you don't find anyone in the Milky Way. Yeah. Sure, yeah, yeah. And let me see, I thought, hmm. I thought I had my on secular quick. Oh yeah, so I, oops, God damn, sorry. <laughs> there, was a, there was just the wrong button. Um, so it's in this one, look at this yellow clump over here. This central clump already collapsed um, and we sort of made a little star spike there. But uh, in this case, it was about 200 AU out. We had another, clump that was already ready formed. And we have other cases where it's triplet uh, systems like these. And, but again, we can calculate it further. I mean, people do, but they invent stuff. You know, they throw in zinc particles and they remove some stuff. And, and it's sort of, you know, yes, it gives you some answers, but it, it's just not, you know, mathematically sound. So I don't know what to make of that. Uh, but you can play these games and, um, if you do those, play those games, actually putting particles in, you're most likely to, um, which uh, these uh, groups have done, 
you, you generally get into this mode where you think everything's fragmenting, everything little blobs and bits. Um, but it's, it's still true that the central object always grows the quickest and you actually don't move a lot of mass from it. Uh, but I think, you know, these approaches and I've done it in other contexts, I think is very dangerous because it's mathematically just not sound, uh, you know. Oh yeah, so that's the easiest ones for us to find in the sense that, you know, uh, it's in the initial collapse, it's already there. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of things that would happen in this 100,000 years that we would like to model. And so uh, tighter binaries would form later on than the ones we see. So the, I think that in the distribution, it's definitely from the scales where it's easy for us to find to much smaller scales. Larger, larger separations are much more rare, but smaller separations will be much more common. Mm. Sure, sure. Yeah, it's really sort of a whole timing thing. Um, all of these halos uh, merge like crazy all the time because you're exactly in this period where the, you know, the, the variance is really shallow. Um, and so everything's collapsing at the same time. And, but yeah, it's definitely a sort of a timing issue. And, you know, we really don't have enough statistics to say much more about it. But, I mean, there's, I think all together between all the, I mean, we did like 30 realizations, and I think there might be a handful of others from other people that did. Um, um, okay, let's see. Oh yeah, it's, um, okay. So let me then explain this one plot, which you know I thought that was really cool. I put in this range from 30 to 300 solar masses. So now we should know what then happens. Um, and Hege and Woosley sort of make these models where they show you what is the final mass uh, that you get if you start with this initial mass of a population three star. And so uh, let's start with the really high masses. So if you're like a, a few hundred solar masses, then you see you know, this black line, it just says, oh, okay. You take pretty much most of that mass and you put it in a black hole and they call it direct black hole formation. Okay, so that's really big and it, it just, there's little it can do. It just doesn't know how to throw off its envelope. And once it's done with the fusion reaction, it just, okay, everything, everything goes in the black hole. But then there's this funny band here, and that's the parent stability supernovae. And that's, that's this crazy thing that we, we love as the, you know, for theoretical reasons, we love this explosion mechanism. We're not sure whether we've ever seen one in the universe, um, but theoretically, that's the nicest one of all um, because it, it just has this thing. And I already said in words earlier on, you're really hot. All your energy goes in elect electron positron pairs that stores it in rest mass energy and the whole star contracts. Eventually it finds itself saying, oh my God, I have a lot of electrons and positrons and they start annihilating again. And so they deposit all that energy back in and now disrupt the entire star. And so is essentially numerically, that's the easiest one to handle of all of the supernova mechanisms. And, but even for that one, we're really not sure about this range. This is 140 to 260 solar masses, but that's non-rotating models, POP3. If you start with rotation, it's actually quite sensitive. Um, and then there's this whole band just below it where you have brief periods of parent stability driven instabilities so you do these sort of hiccups, you know, and so now you can sort of throw off parts of your envelope. And if you only have a 1D code, you're not gonna be very good in estimating how much you're throwing away. So now, you know, that, that's a terribly uncertain um, part, but it might make a huge difference now if you wanna predict what's my final outcome black hole, uh, because I could have thrown out quite a bit of mass or, I, or maybe not. Uh, nevertheless, <clears throat> sort of below 100, you might sort of make uh, as much as 70 solar mass black holes. And then you have sort of uh, sharp drop-offs depending on the dynamics of your supernovae. But all of these things would still make be black holes with sort of different channels in this region. But the entire thing in the range that we think is reasonable, you either make a black hole or you disrupt the entire star. 
Um, but we don't trust the numbers very much on this because rotation and you know a full 3D understanding of how the those stars live is just elusive uh, from us. And at lower masses, you could also you know leave some neutron stars or white dwarfs behind. Okay, just briefly, I'm thrilled about this. I'm, this this was the computer where he's done the largest calculation ever on this, and it just sits on my desk right now. It's way too loud because the UPS is horrible. Um, that says it has to go in a closet soon. Um, but it's kind of crazy. It's a two terabytes, uh, 128 cores. It's totally fine uh, for this. It's very dynamic. And doing um, these, the SSD drives is the ones that are, to me, you know, coming back to it from so, so long time ago. It's crazy. Doing four SSDs on RAID 0, um, I just have crazy throughput on the, on the disk. So also the analysis uh, is super fun. And it's really, I mean, you know, it's expensive computer, but the, the ones where I did all my other works before many of my students got your PhD thesis on cost uh, half a million and it had 72 cores and 400 gigs of RAM. And now I have two terabytes. Anyhow, so I'm, I just love this. And next year, they're already coming out with chips with twice the core count. And two years later, we're probably going to go up to six terabytes for a single two, uh, two slot system. Anyhow, so then I would have had to, so many things to say about, you know, these stars then do H2 regions and um, really show, oh, let me see. They, yeah, so you have massive stars, you know, that then put out uh, radiation and you sort of see how they ionize the region around it. They shape the whole nebula uh, on this side. Then they explode. You have the supernova remnant coming out. And then actually material starts falling back into that halo. And there's another star that forms in the same, same halo uh, once, once there was good gas in fall again. Um, the other bit then, if you sort of zoom out a little bit, that it's not just a single object, you know, you really should be thinking fireworks. Right, like all this region is our Milky Way that will have a hundred thousand of these stars. They just keep going off, and they're only like two, three million years, uh, you know, at a time. So you have a few hundred million years where you just have all these stars just keep popping off. Um, and there's sort of you know their supernova remnants. They put out extra shells, and then all that material that was ionized once is now start to recombine again. But it's also then falling back together again. And so then these objects, you know, already had three objects before, and then some of them had heavy elements in them. Others left just some black holes behind. And there is, you know, it's just such a beautiful long story. And you know, if you just left a black hole in it. I'm gonna just show you this. No, actually, let me skip this. Like, so black holes are really fun. Um, they, but at the uh, the same time, they, you know, where the black hole forms, you first had this H2 region, then you had a supernova potentially, depending on the mass range. So now you blew out all the gas. The black hole sits really in this hot, low density region. And then when, um, when you look and it, you follow, in this case, we followed 25 of these black holes um, over hundreds of millions of years of evolution and they accreted in total three solar masses. That's it. So they spend all their time in the wrong places. So it's completely, so that's not a really interesting channel to make supermassive black holes like people always say. So here's in, a, in this diagram, density versus temperature just following where one of those black holes is going yeah, as a function of time. Um, and you know, it just spends all this time either in the hot region or in the low density region. And so both are the worst for you to accrete any gas. And then if, if they do find a little bit of stuff to accrete, then the black hole starts to emit X-rays, which then destroys the feeble thing that they were accreting from. So it's just not a good thing. Um, but I always already then, I mean, this is again, 15 years old, but the, we had just such interesting resolution already on the ISM. 
And you have to imagine this is half a resolution element of the last space, right? So that has 100, uh, 100 million zones in one, compared to one resolution element of your typical galaxy formation simulation. Um, so, I mean, it's just so rich. You know, this, this is sort of the region, you know, where I said it was the fireworks. Like, that's where you had all these objects come together and sort of make up these galaxies full of stars and then, you know, take halos that just had single stars that are falling and merging into them uh, be a thing. Okay, so then perhaps briefly one more before we end. Exactly the same that we just looked at with the fireworks, but now coloring by metallicity. And this is only counting the heavy elements, assuming that we had parent stability supernovae from the first stars. And one of the things I would like to point out is just the yellow regions uh, here is not a lot of them. And, you know, I mean, they're very rare, but we found a few true 10 to the minus four solar uh, metallicity stars in the Milky Way. There is many more 10 to the minus four iron stars in the Milky Way, but they all have like total metallicity of 10 to the minus two. So that's, that's really different. But the 10 to the minus four, I'm really curious. There's a very small chance for them or a few regions where they could possibly form. Um, and that's, that's quite interesting. But you can also imagine that every fluid parsley here has this very complicated backstory. Each one really uh, has, has a very different story of uh, what um, metallicity gets to, how fast it then can cool, given that it can now make dust and also regular molecules. Okay, yeah, so many subtle effects on these uh, things. Okay. So then briefly for the JWST discoveries, like I hope I gave you a sense now, even though I have talked only of bits and lumps that are like 10,000 times smaller than the things people think they've seen with JWST of how many effects and histories and things you might wanna keep in mind before you try to decide what it is that you're seeing you know, in those few red dots. Uh, and the other thing to keep in mind is Every time we do any of these calculations, you know, there, there is so much inhomogeneity to it. You really need to think about from which angle am I seeing it? What am I looking down on? What is the light that being scattered from it? Where, what are the things that are being absorbed, whatnot? And so I think it's gonna be, you know, if some people tell you very simple stories about these early galaxies, it just, that doesn't make sense. You know, none of these things are simple, simple objects. Um, and so, you know, but that's also the positive that we get to enjoy this to figure out these puzzles over the next 20 years while we always get uh, more and more new data. So to finish on time, uh, let me focus or put your attention on these three websites. The music code allows you to make the initial conditions for these type of calculations. Enzo is the code that allows you to evolve them and uh, do the physics. And YT is the large collection of codes that allows you to do all the visualization and analysis of these types of simulation. And I hope that at least some of you, um, you know, might give it a shot. Uh, it takes a long time, but it's a very friendly community that uh, is happy to answer questions. Yeah, so thanks for your time. Yeah, so uh, these stars would not make elements uh, larger than iron. Uh, that's, the, that's made in the R process, which is mostly through mergers of white dwarfs. Uh, Um, the, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. You usually don't get to the Hayashi track. You make the uh, protostar uh, and then you're done with the calculation. And so we don't, we can't do the uh, full radiation transport, but we would need, and actually, even if we could, we couldn't afford the calculation uh, because it's, it's too many dynamical time scales. Actually, let me try and find a few other people that haven't asked a question yet. Please. Yeah, so with the population three uh, work, never. Uh, but I've worked on galactic star formation as well, and I can give a long talk about all the things that are different there. And there's very common to make round wars. And there are um, 
but it's all under this caveat that we kind of put in the answer by doing these sink particles. It's a long story and I would have to show you a bunch of slides, but uh, up initial from primordial initial condition, I really don't see ever being able to make round dwarfs just because the temperatures are too high and all the speeds are too fast. For brown dwarfs, you need to find much cooler regions and isolate a piece of material to allow it to settle. And then you need some massive star to clear out the rest of the gas so it stops accreting. Uh, and then you can keep something a brown dwarf. Yeah, that's where I'm a little rusty, but I know it's, um, it actually, it changes slightly between the lowest part where it's the oxygen going to silicon. And then the higher, higher masses, I think is actually an explosive burning of silicon. Um, well, the, for the simulations I show, it, it really doesn't matter at all because I purely deposited as a bomb, as a thermal bomb on sort of a thousandth of a parsec scale, not on the stellar scale. And then we look at kiloparsec scales, what happens to it. So, if, say again? The, well, the interpretation of what type of metals are that meaning of that metallicity is affected exactly. But in the calculation, we actually didn't include any cooling from oxygen or silicon. So, you know, it would be the same thing. It's just the ratios of what elements you expect in the ejecta is what you read off. Uh, I mean, it's just within the whole range of all the uncertainties we have from the case where there's no parents of the supernova to direct collapse black holes. Um, the, I find it interesting, but I also know it's heavily dependent on rotation and all these things. And, and so, exactly. So now, you know, I don't, you know, we should talk about it, but I, I, don't, think, I don't think there's any really good reason to try to run thousands of simulations capturing all these things because every single part of it is uncertain and none of it has direct observables. So it's kind of not worth the effort. The, um, well, the interesting thing is for all the lower, um, um, yeah, I think you can get two iron actually for the 50 solar mass ones. Uh, All right, um, great. Thank you, thank you, thank you.